Okay, let's chat Fika. So, I'm Yolandi from RLP Training and I'm going to try and get you to understand the FIC Act, the Financial Intelligence Centre Act and compare it to what we have learned in our phase part of your RE5 and RE1 studies. Okay, so RE5 um, is mostly focused on the phase act, RE1 as well, mostly focused on the phase act, but then towards the end of your studies, suddenly you are exposed to a whole new piece of legislation, and that is the FIC Act, or better known as FICA, Financial Intelligence Center Act. Okay, so a very important thing to remember is that FICA is not the same as phase. The biggest difference between the two is when we think about phase, the phase legislation, we are all about the client. We want to protect the client, we want to identify the client's needs and we want to cover their needs, we want to cover their risks and we want to make sure that the client is in the best possible situation or circumstances. With FICA, things are entirely different. So with FICA, we want to protect the country and we want to protect money. We want to protect legally earned money and we want to combat money laundering. So we want to stop bad guys from being able to spend their money. Okay, so um, with the FACE Act, we're all about protecting the client. With FICA, we're all about basically accusing our client of being a bad person before we can identify and verify them. So when we talk about FICA, we also change our entire language. We will now talk about an accountable institution. Let's make a note. So we'll talk about an accountable institution. And these are institutions that have to comply with FICA. Not all FSPs are accountable institutions and not all accountable institutions are FSPs. Okay, so if you're in a financial services environment and you only work in the short-term insurance environment, then you do not have to worry about being an accountable institution, you do not have to worry about FICA, but you still have to know this for the exam. Okay. So an accountable institution is a company identified by the United Nations or an industry identified by the United Nations as a high risk industry or a high risk entity for money laundering activities or terrorist financing activities. So when you have been classified as an accountable institution, it means that you have to comply with FICA regulations. So as an accountable institution, you have to register with the Financial Intelligence Center, the FIC or the FIC, um, and you now have a reporting duty, you have training duties, and you have to comply with the Act as a whole. So all of our FSPs, if you're in long-term insurance, investments, um, medical schemes, those are the guys that have to comply with FICA. But our short-term insurers, you guys are exempted because the risk for money laundering activities and terrorist financing activities have not been identified um, in short-term insurance. Okay, so FICA, all about protecting the money. We have accountable institutions. You'll have a whole list of those in your book if you are one of our registered learners. Um, if you're not one of our registered learners and you would like to register, please send an email to info at rlptraining.co.za. So we'll start with our accountable institutions. Our accountable, inst accountable institutions have a reporting duty. So what is reporting? Reporting is basically informing the FIC of any suspicious or unusual transactions or transactions above the cash threshold. So we will report our suspicious or unusual transactions and we will and report the cash transactions above 49,999 Rand and 99 cents. Okay, um, that is the first duty of our accountable institution. Then our accountable institution is also liable for due diligence. So due diligence is just the fancy word, diligence, there we go, it's just the fancy word for identifying and verifying. If um, you get a question in the exam or you read in your learning material that oh, the FSP must conduct due diligence or the accountable institution must conduct due diligence, it just means that we have to identify and verify our client. It also says that when an accountable institution 
um, interacts with a prospective client, either for a single transaction or for, to establish a business relationship, we have to conduct due diligence. This tells us, because it's a prospective client, we have to conduct due diligence, which means that we have to identify and verify our client before the client actually becomes our client, before the transaction is concluded. Not during the transaction or after, before. And what is the difference between a single transaction and a business relationship? A single transaction is if I enter into an agreement with the client for a single transactional purpose. So, example, if you are in the motor dealership environment and your client is purchasing a vehicle, um, you're going to give the client an invoice for that vehicle that is a single transaction. They're going to pay it and your transaction has been concluded. If the same client comes back tomorrow, you're going to give them a new invoice. They're going to pay that invoice and your transaction has been concluded. Okay, so that is a single transaction. An ongoing business relationship or an ongoing transaction is something that is not a once-off thing. So in the life insurance um, department or industry, we know that our clients will pay a monthly premium. In the banking industry, we know that our clients will pay monthly banking fees. They don't come to us, open their bank account, put their money in there and then close the account. It is an ongoing business relationship. So for single transactions, we have to conduct due diligence before the transaction is concluded. For an ongoing business relationship, we will do due diligence when the uh, relationship is just initiated, so before we establish the relationship. And during the relationship, we have to conduct ongoing due diligence. So we've all been in the situation where um, we have received notification from our bank or you've received an email or a call that your bank says, please come to your nearest branch for FICA purposes. And this is when they conduct ongoing due diligence. Okay. So for ongoing due diligence, the requirement would be for the banks or for whoever your relationship is with, the FSP or the accountable institution in this specific scenario must monitor your transactions. They must um, question any unusual or complex or unusually large transactions. And at any point, if you cannot conduct due diligence, whether it is for a single transaction or during your business relationship, you have to stop business. So if I think of a single transaction example that I used and I said uh, we're in a motor dealership and the client's purchasing a vehicle, single transaction, one invoice, and the client says, oh, um, I can't give you my ID. You cannot verify my identity. Uh, we're not allowed to conclude the transaction. We're not allowed to continue. Um, if it is an ongoing business relationship, so your bank phones you and tells you to please come in for FICA purposes or for due diligence or identify and verification, identification and verification processes, again, if you do not go and um, give them the opportunity to do ongoing due diligence, they will block your account or they will freeze your account because they are not allowed to continue business. And in that situation, they should also consider making a report. So it takes us back to reporting. Reporting, once again, just informing the FIC of an unusual or a suspicious transaction or a transaction above the cash threshold amount. So what happens when they report you as a client? Um, I'm going to give you a little scenario. It happened to me. So I have a bank account with almost every bank, not because I have lots of money, just because I don't know. Um, but I've got a bank account with nearly every bank. And it was a while ago where FMB um, sent me the notification, asked me to please go and visit my nearest branch. I haven't been identified or verified in a very long time. Um, bef yeah, the last time I got identified or verified was before I was married. So my surname has changed, my address has changed, so many, thing ha so many things have changed that it actually makes sense for me to go in and change it. Um, but anyway, they sent me the notification and I said, hmm, let's see what happens. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. And they sent me a second request. Um, I think they actually sent me a third request and I just didn't go. Um, and what happened was they had to block my account. And in that, they might have reported me to the FIC because I'm refusing to be identified and verified. Um, so nothing happens if you report someone that didn't do anything wrong. So if you report a client that is completely innocent, they're not a money launderer, they're not a terrorist, they will not be prosecuted because they did nothing wrong. 
So reporting is basically just informing the FIC of what's happening. They will decide whether it is something that they need to investigate, yes or no. They will decide whether the plan that you have reported um, might be linked to someone that they're currently investigating. That's, as an accountable institution, your only obligation is to report. It's not your obligation to arrest the client or try and sort out the situation, keep them busy until the FBI shows up, nothing like that. Okay. So that is in terms of due diligence. Then we do have what we call additional due diligence. So additional due diligence would be for all of our clients that um, come in the form of a company or a partnership or a trust. So these are guys that do not have ID numbers and they do not have passport numbers. They have registration numbers. So a while ago, quite, long, quite a long time ago, what they have noticed was that the bad guys would hide in companies. So if I say that I have to identify and verify the client only, the bad guy will go and create a company and now you only have to identify and verify that the company exists. And that was obviously a big loophole and a lot of people got away with a lot of things. So now we have additional due diligence. And additional due diligence means that if we have a company, trust or partnership as our client, we have to identify and verify. So we have to conduct customer due diligence with every single one of the partners, the trustees, the directors, the members, so no one can hide. And if we have a company within a company within a company, we have to conduct due diligence right to the end to make sure that we can identify the beneficial owner of the first company, the company that is our client. Okay, so in terms of FICA, every accountable institution must appoint a FICA compliance officer. It is not always the same compliance officer as your face compliance officer, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. Um, in terms of the FICA Act or FIC Act, we have to train our staff on the risk management and compliance program of the accountable institution. So the risk management and compliance program is the internal FICA policy of the accountable institution. This is the policy that tells our staff how to identify people, how to verify people, when to report, how to report. They will have to appoint a reporting person. So again, I know we're preparing for RE, but your reporting person is not your key individual or your rep. Whole new language. The reporting person in general, or normally, it would be someone that has direct, con direct contact or access to your bank account, the bank account of the FSB, because they would know when cash deposits have been made. Um, so anyone and everyone in the accountable institution is allowed to approach this reporting person and say, Hi, reporting person, this is the situation that I just had with a client. Can we please report it to the FIC? And then blah, 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 boop, sends it on the portal, the FIC portal, um, and that's it. Very, very important thing, it's hush hush. Once we have reported a client, we are not allowed to tell the client that we have reported them. We are not allowed to discuss the contents of the report or anything about the report unless you are legally obligated to discuss it. But you're not allowed to disclose it to the client. The client's not allowed to be tipped off. Um, and then in terms of our cash reporting, any cash transaction, this is physical cash, like make it rain type of cash. Any cash transaction with a client paid in an amount more than 49,999 rand and 99 cents must be reported to the FIC. Even if it's not weird, even if there's no reason for suspicion or um, it's not unusual for your type of business, it still has to be reported. And again, if your client did not do anything bad, nothing bad will happen to them. We also have a different penalty under the FIC Act than with FAIS. With FICA, non-compliance with the FIC Act can lead to a fine of up to 100 million rand or imprisonment of up to 15 years. It's either or, not both. With FICA, it is not both. With FAIS, it's either the one or the other or both, but FICA, it's either the one or the other.